maybe because people doubted me so much that I just like turned into this very humble human where I wasn't uplifting my own self yeah. though. And that is very damaging. Yeah. And I got over that. Like, why do I have to lower myself to make this person feel comfortable when this is just really who I am? The whole bag of philosophy, it's a way of being, right? It's just being unapologetic, taking up space, commanding your worth, not backing down, calling out bullshit, just like doing your life on your own terms. I'm Lisa Carmen Wang, and I'm the founder of The Bad Bitch Empire. Welcome back to The Bad Bitch Empire. Today, I'm here with Lindsay Napella Berg. She is a three-time Olympian and two-time Olympic silver medalist volleyball player turned entrepreneur, real estate investor, and budding crypto investor. Lindsay, welcome to the Bad Bitch Empire. Thank you so much. I'm so honored <laughs> to be here. So happy I'm in New York and be able to do this in person with you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. So you have a storied background as an athlete. And as an athlete myself, I know what it's like, the intensity and all the things that you face, the challenges and getting back up after you fall. But Take us back to the beginning of your volleyball career. And I'm curious if good girl brainwashing affected you throughout the sport. Yeah, I uh, grew up born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. My father was from Los Angeles, uh, moved to Hawaii, met my mom. Um, and he was a volleyball player and basketball, but volleyball was his love. And I played practically since out of the womb, I'd be on his lap and he'd be doing the bump set spike motions while I was a kid. And I watched him and I fell in love with it and definitely no pressure from him to play. And I just begged people to continue to play with me by seven. I was playing on a team and it just continued. Um, but definitely there is that good girl brainwash that goes on, I think, not only for me, but just in general for women's sports. I believe that we're treated different than male athletes. Uh, even to this day, I think it's improving a little bit um, because people are speaking up more. But definitely it was always like, yes, coach, I'm doing this. And not that we should have rebuttaled or talked back to our coach. But no matter what it was, we were expected to do it do it how they wanted us to do it, say nothing, and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that even went up to me playing professionally, which is, I think, crazy because that's your job and you should have a voice, um, definitely when you have a job and being a professional in general. So I definitely experienced that. Um, it was frustrating, especially when I became an adult and making money and having to deal with things that I see the guys aren't dealing with. So I definitely think not only for volleyball, but in general for women's sports, it happened and it still happens. Yeah. I mean, as a gymnast, I just remember now looking back as an adult, I can see how this really almost abuse of power, right? When you've got young girls who are dedicating their life to the sport and your dream is really in the hands of your coach. Yeah. And what can you do but silently obey? Right. And I think, I mean, I have so many stories, you know, and I have coaches that I believe were the hardest on me, which now looking back, um, not everyone was hard on me because I was gifted and started at a very early age. So there were some that just were like, oh, Lindsay's going to do her thing. Let her do her thing because she's the best. And then there were ones that were harder on me because they knew I could be better, but almost to an extent that was like disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I still have relationships with these coaches. And now we look back and laugh at it, but I'm pretty much like that wasn't OK, mm -hmm. you know, and not to push, but like how it happened. Mm. Um, so it's interesting now of going through so many experiences and being able to look back and also see how things are going nowadays where kids are talking back, back mm -hmm. to coaches, which I don't know if I completely believe in that. I think there can be like a, a middle ground to it. Yeah. Um, but it's very interesting now that just after all of that to look back at it and be yeah. like, huh, yeah. yeah, I definitely just did it and you didn't know question authority didn't at all. question it and yeah and so I know that you 
consider yourself a bit of an underdog in terms of getting to the Olympic level. So tell us about how you really got started and what were some of the early challenges that you had to overcome? Yeah, so fortunately my dad was a coach and I started very early. So my skill level was elite at a very early age. What people questioned was my physical stature, uh, my physical ability, what I looked like, uh, them thinking because of what I look like that I wasn't as fast or I wasn't as athletic. And I had to overcome all of that side talk. And fortunately, there wasn't social media back then because I can't imagine growing up with the social media now and having to see that type of thing as well instead of just hearing it. You know what I mean? So I had to deal with that. Fortunately, in Hawaii, I was one of the best. But when it came time to get recruited for college, I had people being like, no, you're too short. And I'm like, no, but I'm like really good, you know, in my head and to my parents and like, I can make your team better. I can make the players around me better. And so I had to deal with that all of my career. Mm -hmm. um, even up to my last Olympics, there were people saying, why is she still, why is she on the Olympic team? And I was in three. And I, it was a chip on my shoulder. So it motivated me more. Um, that was my experience with it. But I can't say that I hurt, didn't hurt inside mm -hmm. all the time. So it was always about your height? It was about my height. Uh, everyone thought I was always overweight. So they looked at me, then thought I was going to be slow because of it. Um, and it just went on and on and on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Were you asked to lose weight? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In college, professionally, with the Olympic team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. And how did you respond to that? I did my best to do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I knew there was always times where I could be in a little better shape, but it actually wasn't changing my volleyball game. Mm. So I remember when I was my lightest, it was training for my first Olympics. Uh, we had a Japanese coach and I really dedicated once he gave me a chance because it was very rare that I got that chance not being an All-American. Once he gave me that chance, I was like, oh, I'm going to make this team. I'm like, what you shouldn't have done was give me this chance because you're going to have to take me because I'm going to prove myself. Yeah. So I did it. And then I found myself playing worse. I was miserable. Mm -hmm. I was doing something that he wanted me to do for what I look like practically. It didn't help me on the court. Yeah. And so... What did you do after that? You were just like, screw this. I'm going to eat. I mean, I practically maintained it, mm -hmm. you know, and I just proved myself on the court. So at yeah. some point in time, he couldn't say anything anymore mm. because it was it. I was going to make my first Olympics. Yeah. And the other people behind me were not going to make it, whether I looked like that, whether I was five pounds heavier or five pounds lighter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but what the pressure he put on me made me just miserable as a person. So I couldn't for a second. I mean, I almost quit. I remember dragging my bags down the hallway. We lived in dorms in Colorado Springs. Yeah, I was there too. <laughs> players, right? Crazy. And my teammates were like, Linz, you're so like, you're so close to this. You have this. You can't let go. But I was miserable. I'm like, it's not supposed to be like this. Mm. And I just had to, you know, change it and look at it a different way that I loved the people I was around. I loved playing. I loved winning. So let me change my mindset and not even deal with that. If he wants me to lose weight, I'll do my best. Maybe it will happen. Maybe it won't. But what I'm going to do is make this team better. Mm. Where do you think your drive came from? I think everyone doubting me. I'm very fortunate that my tight circle, as far as my family, never doubted me, never mm -hmm. said I couldn't do it, this and that. And I know that's a struggle for a lot of people, family just in general. Yeah. And I have the best family, something I've never had to worry about. But the rest of the volleyball world, I just wanted to prove <laughs> them wrong. I was yeah. so pissed off. Yeah. I was like, how can you not see my talent? Mm. How can you not see that I make my teammates better? That was always my thing. Yeah. I might one-on-one -on -one compared to my competition. I mean, she's going to win the one-on-one. -on -one, but is she making the people around her better? Mm. 
Did your teammates recognize that? Oh, yeah. Okay. It was never an issue with my teammates. Yeah. So it was with the coaches? Yeah. Hmm. Coaches, fans, hmm. volleyball critics. Got it. And would you say that the camaraderie on the team was really strong? Yeah, I think from team to team, it's different. Uh, when you're dealing, especially getting to the Olympic level, you're dealing with the best of the best and very big personalities in general. Because yeah. each person had to be special in some sort of way, whether it was physical, leadership, intensity, drive. They're the best of the best and whatever that was that got them there. Mm -hmm. So combining, it's about 24 women that are always training to be the top 12 to go to the Olympics. It's about 24 to 30, let's say. Mm -hmm. Just dealing with that many different personalities of people that are that good at what they do is interesting management. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, women in general is interesting management. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a lot of emotions involved. Um, yeah. A lot of talking involved. Um, but I wouldn't say we always had the best relationships. Mm. And I think, though, that's what stopped us, especially, say, my first Olympics, from winning a medal when we definitely had the best individuals. Mm. But I will all say we didn't have the best team. And what do you think makes it so that there are great individuals, but not the best team? Yeah, I think, especially in sport, and I guess probably in business as well, if you're there on the court or you're in your office with your marketing team for a big company or whatever it is, you have to respect the people next to you. You have to learn how to respect them, whether it's having to get to know them better, to understand their story or why they're there or why they act the way they do. In the job, there needs to be a level of respect for each other. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to hang out outside the court or outside the office, no problem. But if you can't have a level of respect for the person standing next to you, for the person who supposedly has the same goals as you, and you can't figure out how to work it out, it's never going to work. Mm. So was it like individual drama or it was just like actually about the sport and not being able to assist each other on the court? I think it's a mixture. Mm. There were so many different situations. Yeah. And so. And leadership as well. I can't mm. say that there wasn't um, an issue with the leadership from coaching staff as well. Because they're also dealing with all of us women as personalities. So it's up to them of what they want to step in with and what they don't want to step in with. Mm. Um, but I do think it also comes back to uh, we were being controlled so much as well. We weren't able to live just our life and come and do work. So my last Olympics, we had a coach that gave us the freedom a little bit more. We go to practice, we do our work, we get it done in three and a half hours, and we go and live our lives. And that was the best team I'd ever been on. Mm. Because we just dedicate that time to how important that was, and then we went and lived our lives. If mm. you hung out with some players, cool. If you didn't, cool. And but we weren't living in a dorm in Colorado oh. Springs either. <laughs> So when you say control, it was they were controlling your life on and off the court. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was very hard in Colorado Springs. We're adults from 21 to 40 living in a dorm room mm. with another woman walking down the hall with our little shower caddy to take a shower. And, you know, that's what a lot of professional sports are especially Olympic athletes, both men and women, uh, what people don't know. Yeah. That it's not glamorous. Exactly. Unless you're NBA or WNBA basketball player, or maybe some hockey players, you know, in different of the bigger sports. But we even were one of the luckier of the smaller sports. I know wrestlers that you had to be in the top three of their weight class to even have a room. Mm. And they couldn't have another job because yeah. they were training all day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was at Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center when I was like 18, 17. Right. So I right. can't imagine what that's like when you have to do that at 30, 40. Like my first year is sharing a bunk bed with, I think she was 34 yeah. and I was 21. Yeah. And I'm just like, 
why are we even How sharing? Are doing- First of all, why are we even sharing a room? Yeah. I hadn't done that since freshman year in college. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why is a 35 year old sharing a room? Yeah. <laughs> um, so your first Olympics, you've, you've been to three. What happened after the first one? So after the first one, we didn't medal. I was the backup that Olympics, but got to play often, but I was the backup and we underachieved. Mm. Uh, it was also in Athens where right before the Olympics, um, we declared war. Mm. So at the Olympics, we couldn't wear any USA gear unless we are going to and from a game. We felt no like representation of like why, what the Olympics were about. So overall, it, no matter if we medaled or not medaled, I was like, this can't be what the Olympics is supposed to be. Um, I was just burnt out. You know, I had to lose 20 pounds that whole two years. You know what I mean? I just, it was a lot. And I really had lost love for the sport, which that was like my first love in general. And I was almost ready to like be done and move on from volleyball. And fortunately I got an offer from an Italian coach that saw me for the last two years. He was a coach on the Italian national team and he loved my grit. He loved my intensity. Like that's, Italians are like really passionate, you know, and they made me a great offer. And I was just like, let me see if I can get the love back. Mm. Like I cannot end this incredible career on that note. Um, And I got it back. Yeah. It's so interesting because I said the same thing about my gymnastics career when I um, hit a low point was like, also, I can't end my career on a low note because winners don't quit when they're down. Right. And so what was it like? You spent years in Italy training? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens with us is for us to make our real money, let's say, I mean, Mm -hmm. we make a little money with the national team, USA, but our real money, we have to play professionally overseas. Hopefully Mm -hmm. that's going to change. They're trying to do a couple leagues here in the States. Um, but I mean, I love playing overseas, but there are some people that didn't. So I probably, if I did it all over again and there was a league in the States or a league overseas, I'd probably go back overseas. Um, but I played seven seasons in Italy. Uh, in between there, I got the love back. So I played in the 2008 Olympics as well. And then my last season in Italy, then went to the 2012 Olympics. And then I finished my career in Turkey after the 2012 Olympics. Mm. So... We play for that country, but if your team is good enough, you also play against different teams from different countries as well. Got it. Yeah. And um, so after your volleyball career, Mm -hmm. um, I think there's my experience when I left my gymnastics career was like almost a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you've spent decade plus really focused on this sport. And then now you have to find your next love, your next passion. So How did you finish your career and what was that transition like? Yeah, so I had always been prepared for (laughs) when my knee was going to give out on me. I had a really bad knee. It was like, oh, am I going to make it another year? Am I going to make it another year? And then in 2012, even playing on a real broken knee, practically bent, um, I played my best volleyball ever. And we got silver. We should have gotten gold. I'm not sad about it. Obviously, I want a gold medal, but it was definitely uh, the best quad, as we call it, and the best team I'd played on. And if we had to play the final match again, we'd probably win. It was just one of those, you know, like Super Bowl, sometimes the best team doesn't win. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of like that. So I had been prepared, even though I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Rio too. I want gold. (laughs) I was like, but fortunately, the head coach was like, Lindsay, you probably should stop for your knee. Um, I still would have tried. Let me tell you, if you would have given me the opportunity to try, Mm -hmm. I probably would have hobbled my way to wherever I could have. But so I had always been a little bit prepared. And I knew that I never wanted a nine to five. That was just like never me. I always saw my dad doing real estate. I always had an entrepreneurial kind of creative spirit. I loved fashion. I loved interior design. And I kind of always felt like I would be an investor in something or own my own business. And so the first thing I got involved in was a gym with Jay Glazer, who is on Fox Sports and has done a lot of MMA stuff, is a journalist, and he was opening up a gym. And I asked him if I could invest in it. 
I thought I was going to be a silent investor. That didn't happen, <laughs> but I'm not mad about it. I've learned so much. I've had to step in and be a manager sometimes, be very involved. We're still going and it's turned into a great brand. So that was kind of like my first little after volleyball investing, but I still felt like I was part of a team. I still felt like, oh, I got a place to work out and be healthy. So that was like my first uh, after volleyball thing. Cool. And then did you start coaching? Yeah. So everyone wanted me to coach. Um, that is the normal transition for a volleyball player that doesn't know what they want to do or doesn't want to go and start work and get coffee for someone after being going to three Olympics. Yeah. Because we have no experience in anything else, you know. And we don't have that resume that a lot of people look for to get an entry level job. Mm -hmm. And we also don't want an entry level job. We're just like, we went to three Olympics. Like, I got to get coffee for you for 30K. Mm -hmm. So that's you usually know? like the, it's almost the dilemma. It's like either you become a coach or you have to start from the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I would have been a great coach. I did a couple of favors um, back home in Hawaii for a coach that we knew was retiring. That was like my second dad. He lost an assistant. So I did that. Of course, going home is incredible. Uh, Hawaii gets 10,000 people a game, mm. and I didn't stay at home to play. So that was incredible for that experience. Did another um, favorite Pepperdine. Um, that is where I really knew that I don't want to do it. And nothing yeah. about Pepperdine. I'm just like, you're doing favors. Mm. I don't want to do this. But Everyone wants me to do it. And you hear you got to give back to volleyball. You got to be a part of the sport. Why don't you want to do this? You can help so many people over and over again. Mm. And how did that make you feel? That I had to give back. Mm. And not necessarily in the coaching way because I finally figured out and was strong enough to say, I don't want to do this. No matter how good I am at it, I don't want to do this. And I should have a choice of what I want to mm. do. So I tried to start a content project, which in my head and is more creative because at the end of the day, I feel like I am a creative and I wanted to do something special to give the next generation a cheat code of how to overcome all the obstacles that we had to go through and overcome and figure it out ourselves. And so in 2018, I came up with the Core project. Um, Core means heart in Italian. I used that because I got my heart back for the game in Italy. And I wanted to do, again, something different. Um, yeah, and I followed around the current Olympians and asked them every question in the possible world that I could ask them. Put together cute little videos, taped them overseas that nobody saw, and did that for about two and a half years. And I just couldn't get people to support it. Mm. And so... Why do you think that is? And, and what obstacles specifically were you focusing on? Uh, I think why I couldn't get the support is that our sport competes with each other too much rather than uplifting each other. Mm. So say it's, you know, different club volleyball teams or one association compared to the other association. It's always like, who's the best rather than like using our resources. Everybody can use the same resources and it's fine, but let's just become a bigger and better sport. I think that's one issue. Um, and the second question, sorry, was- About the obstacles. So you're saying you wanted to get content around yeah. all the obstacles. They yeah, I mean, it's players. like, how do you deal with being 13 and being 6'2"? How do you deal with getting bullied at school? How, do you, how did you deal with it when you couldn't ask your parents because they weren't athletes? Who do you run to? So all of those different things. Uh, or how do you deal with getting called fat and trying to still make it? Um, every, every question. I literally, what's your favorite shampoo? And why do you use it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I was going from here to here with it yeah. of trying to see like what the kids would react to. And unfortunately, I think it was a little too deep mm. for uh, the volleyball world, a yeah. little too serious. And I am not going to have them do a dance video on TikTok and put my name behind that. That's mm -hmm. just like not what I represent. And 
I feel like I put in my all for two and a half years. I spent a lot of money. I spent a lot of time. Mm. Um, I still have all of it, which I'm willing to continue to share, collaborate. But I just couldn't like put all of me into it mm. with lack of support. Yeah. And so you paused that project in 2021. Yeah. And then what did you start focusing on after that? Well, first of all, when I paused it, my shoulders went from the top of my head, like down a (laughs) foot. It was like I was tense and like pressured and felt this responsibility to give back to a sport where I had to prove myself for so long. Mm. And like, why was I again trying to prove myself Mm. in trying to do good for the sport? Um, So first of all, I felt relieved. Um, I didn't feel like a quitter. I felt like I did my very best to to give back to the sport. Yeah. Um, So from then, I just knew that I wanted to do things that excited me. Um, At that point, I was on, I had two residential properties that I was renting out. Um, I really enjoyed designing both of those. Even it's just for me, it wasn't a moneymaker, but now they're rental properties. So that is a passive moneymaker for me. The gym is still going. Um, the brand was, the brand is developed. I hope one day we sell, you know, that's like our goal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just started, once I let go of that project, I started meeting different people in different spaces that interest me. Yeah. Um, Other doors and opportunities and not necessarily like immediately money makers or a job I wanted to take. But just like the conversations were different when I was in me of who I knew was like really me Mm -hmm. and accepted me being okay with not being volleyball me. Yeah. Did you so you said like this volleyball world where you had to continually prove yourself. So do you feel like you were never fully accepted? by that space? 100%. I still don't Mm. after three Olympics. And is it because of from that early time being the underdog, being told you didn't fit in, you know, height, weight, or is it more than that? I don't know. Mm. You know, um, there are a couple conversations I do want to have um, (laughs) with a couple people and kind of understand it a little bit more. Um, But I was always not only the underdog, I was always um, doing things a little different. Mm. And that makes people uncomfortable. Mm. Um, Like what? Just in general of how I would choose to train or doing the content project that nobody had dug that deep Mm -hmm. and was willing to become vulnerable and like talk about these things. It makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so I think that I'm always pushing a button, but a button for us to be better. Yeah. Not to cause an issue or a problem. Yeah. Because I want us to grow and evolve. And I just think sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. And um, a lot of people like to stay in the zone of feeling comfortable. Yeah. And um, I learned how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think that's yeah. why I got so far. And I'm still okay of trying to do that to excel in life or be happier in what I'm doing or make other people better. Today's episode is brought to you by FTX US, the most complete crypto and finance app to buy and sell crypto with up to 85% lower fees than top competitors. You can trade NFTs with no fees, track your entire portfolio, and use a crypto-friendly debit card at millions of retailers. Plus, they're even launching stocks. Download the FTX US app by going to the link in the description and using the code BADBITCHES to earn free crypto on every trade over $10. Again, link in the description. Use code BADBITCHES to sign up so we can start investing and break the crypto boys club. All right, back to today's episode. Well, I think that one thing I've learned is that if people aren't receptive to getting out of their comfort zone, you can't force them to. Yep. It's something that they have to come to on their own. And what what we can do is just lead by example, right? right? It's like, I see a bad bitch, Maybe I want to be a bad bitch, but right. I can't be like, you got to be a bad bitch. Right, right. You can, yeah. All you can do is, especially right now as well, of learning 
about crypto and NFTs with you and some other people is like, I'm trying to also now give back to some of the players, like the current professional players and give them opportunities to get in early, or at mm -hmm. least from what I know, yeah. hey, I'm getting this opportunity. I can bring you guys in if you want to. And, but at the end of the day, it's their choice. Like, yeah. I can't make them do it. I can't make them respond to an email, an introduction mm -hmm. email that I want to make, Yeah, you know? So... But I'm going to continue to be me yeah. and I'm going to continue to learn. I'm going to continue to provide opportunities for the people that are following me that do see me. Oh, Lindsay's living this life. Mm -hmm. How can I live that life? Because, yeah. you know, she's not coaching volleyball. She's not doing these other things that are the normal path. Okay, maybe, maybe I should talk to her for a second. Yeah. Because I'm really, anything I learn and get approached with, I want to share. Yeah. I am not trying to keep this to myself, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. I can't necessarily share my real estate with you, but I can share how I did it. Yeah. Um, and so that is like one of the big things that I want to continue to do. If I can't give back to the young kids in the volleyball world, I at least can give back to the generation that's like right after me that are making their money and they're making mm -hmm. good money now, like more money than we were making yeah. to be able to invest, set their future up, build wealth for them and their families. I mean, if I can do that, I would love that. Yeah. So curious because... This world that you've had to prove yourself over and over to even belong to, um, even though you've been super successful in it, you keep referring to giving back to this yeah. particular community. Yeah. Why do you think that is and, and why not widen it, you know, to right. different athletes or just the generation yeah, this, in that's general? The best question ever. <laughs> and, you know, this is something I have conversations with myself about and healing about mm. of where is there just so much guilt from the past that lives with me? You know what I mean? Um, guilt the, on your end? Or? No, on, yeah, of my end, just feeling like, because everyone talks about that you need to give back, mm -hmm. of just always feeling it and holding on to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would do it for anybody. I have a lot of friends that are not volleyball players. I just think what also I hold deeply is I know what we experience as a smaller sport, and we're not necessarily given the opportunities to be in rooms mm. always. And so I still feel that. And I love the women that I got to know doing the Quote Project. Like I got to really know them and only maybe like two or three were on my team. So these were like new women to me and I got to know them. And I, you know, I want to help in that way because we're not given the opportunity to be in a room with you unless I met you through another person. You know yeah. what I mean? Or the opportunities to invest that basketball, NBA basketball players get to be in all these rooms in Silicon Valley and invest because they also have millions. Mm -hmm. But like, why can't we give five to 10 K and have that opportunity to do it mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, hit the jackpot, maybe not, yeah. but also learn mm -hmm. of how I want to learn from you. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, you know, that's just direct access. People I have direct ac access mm -hmm. to because, yeah. like, I have them on my phone. So if I yeah. can help them, cool. Yeah. But obviously I would love to help whoever if I yeah. can. Yeah, I think it's something that I've experienced in terms of widening my circle. Because mm -hmm. starting from gymnastics, which is, like, an even smaller, uh, like, little sport, I think, comparatively to, to some of the bigger sports in the U.S. Um, but... I think the moment I ended my career, I was like, I'm going to find my next identity yeah. and I'm going to figure out the mental gymnastics, you know, like find my intellectual passion. And I really just like shut that chapter. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not looking back. And I think I also felt like I didn't necessarily belong. I was one of the few Asian faces. Um, and I was always very introverted, which just like didn't jive well with the socialization mm -hmm. of the girls. And, um, and and then, so I think like I found myself being like, I'm going to prove myself by being successful in everything else. Right. And so then becoming an entrepreneur. And then when I became an entrepreneur, I was like, oh, these are my people because they take risks. They, mm -hmm. they take an idea, they turn it into reality. And then going into investing, you know, that kind of coincided with my passion of uplifting women. I was like, women become entrepreneur or get funded less mm -hmm. than men. We also invest less than men. 
And so the women who then enter into the crypto space have an even different level of risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just want to be around women who are like the odd ones out and then like really being yeah. uncomfortable and like embracing that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I found it's like more about the traits almost and finding those communities where you have the higher likelihood of meeting the people who have the similar traits that yeah. you admire. Like-minded yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I think my new identity, or not new, because I think I was always there, but just being so unapologetically me mm -hmm. in whatever it is. Like a bad bitch. Yeah, <laughs> just I'm going to wear what I want to wear. Yeah. And people tell me to wear tighter clothes, this and that. But guess what? My baggy style works for me. Mm. And I know that. Yeah. Because people tell me that. Yeah. So I think what attracts people, though, and the energy, at least recently, I'd say in the two, last two or three years for me, is really being comfortable and even more and more comfortable in my own skin. Mm. What do you think the the transition has been? I know after the Kore project, that was yeah. big, but any other catalysts? I think I don't know what made me understand my worth. I can't like pin pinpoint it. But it was getting to that point mm -hmm. of understanding my worth of well-rounded, being well-rounded. Like, Lindsay, you can't, even though everyone else might put you in this volleyball box, like, that is not you. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not you. You've proven that it's not yeah. you. Um, and I think just the energy of being open to expanding, whether it's my circle whether it's friendships, whether it's relationships in general, whether it's one meeting with one person and being like, oh, we should follow up. Mm -hmm. When maybe back in the day, I just kind of like was comfortable with my little circle. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think expanding, expanding your social circle, but also tightening it yeah. to the types the of, time. yeah, to yeah. the types of people that really uplift you energetically and like help you become a better person. Yeah. I definitely have gone through some friendships where, you know, you don't always need to be like, get your ass uh, kissed and like everything's like, oh, it's so good. That's so good. You look great. Da, 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 da. You want to be challenged as well. But there is a point where like we have to uplift each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's been a very interesting experience, uh, I'd say, with friendships in my last four years, five years. Mm. Um, but what I do know is I want to be surrounded by people that are uplifting each other in whatever way they can. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes calling each other out or challenging each other. But at the end of the day, does the core of you want the best for that person next yeah. to you? And that's who I want to be surrounded by. Yeah. And it's like, that can be tough. I think one thing I've experienced is just jealousy, right? Mm -hmm. As you become more successful yeah. and then you... It, it's hard to sometimes suss out is someone being nice to me because yeah. they actually care and yeah. want what's best or just because yeah. they want to be a part of the rocket ship. Yeah. I think I always, um, not diminish, but would like, you know, like not talk about myself as much or my accomplishments mm -hmm. as much, maybe because people doubted me so much that I just like turned into this very humble human where I wasn't uplifting my own self yeah. though. And that is very damaging. Yeah. And I got over that. Like, why do I have to lower myself to make this person feel comfortable when this is just really who I am? Exactly. And I found myself doing that really, really often. I mean, still to this day, I will not introduce myself. Hi, I'm Lindsay Berg, three-time Olympian, two-time <laughs> silver medalist. You know what I mean? But I am more likely, if someone asks me, like, yeah. tell me your story or this and that, to unapologetically tell you my story. Yeah. And I just like wouldn't talk great about myself for such a long time. And uh, I've changed that. Yeah. So maybe that was the, you know. Yeah. I did the same thing. Yeah. And it, it's weird because you're almost like embarrassed by your success to yeah. like talk about it. And I, yeah, like I, I had that moment where I really shifted. I'm like, why am I not talking about something that I dedicated a decade of my life to and like killed myself for the sport? And actually it's really impressive. Yeah. Because not a lot of people can do it. And so 
I just, you know, I actually do bring in the gymnast part now. I'm like, I'm a four-time U.S. national champion gymnast turned serial entrepreneur, angel and crypto investor, speaker, author, all these things. And it's almost like you start to notice like when you own it, you mm-hmm. just say it matter of fact. Yeah. You're like, yeah, it's this just is thing. what it is. I just do. I did it. Like, But I'm glad you're doing yeah. that because it is part of your story. Yeah. And like I do believe that every little, whether it was the high school and then going to randomly Minnesota for college from Hawaii, like every mm-hmm. little step had a purpose. Yeah. You know, and it was just like, can I, could I, and can I understand what the purpose of that was to be able to build on it? Yeah. And I think that's the power of having a, like a mindset that says, no matter what happens, it's a blessing. And I turn it into the right story for me. Right. Yeah. Because it is our choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then when you... Now, as you know, your worth, right? Mm -hmm. So you're able to then, do you feel like spot energy? That's, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm for sure meeting different people. Yeah. And what I consider the right people, um, giving time, more time and energy to those situations, Mm -hmm. um, spotting something really easy that is not worth my time. Yeah. Um, Whether it's business, friendship, relationship, all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like being okay, having that strong feeling instead of questioning it. Yeah. 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 I, I recently, I did, um, I don't know if you've ever done Reiki. Uh, I've done it before. Yeah. My, my auntie in Hawaii (laughs) does it. Um, but no, I do. I have a healer in LA that I've been working with of like sound bath and that Mm -hmm. type of thing, which never before I not that I didn't believe in it. It just kind of wasn't my thing. Yeah. But then when I met this lady, I was like, oh, I got some things I want to work through. And like, yeah. it was because of her though. And the energy that she gave me mm-hmm. to get me to do it. And she didn't even like try to get me to do it. I was just like, let's try this. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I did it because like, I I genuinely believe that everything is energy. Yeah. Right. And I'm I'm very sensitive to energy and so I think sometimes when I'm not careful and I've been in Mm -hmm. like you know very crowded situations Mm -hmm. or you're going to meetings and then you don't realize you're like a few weeks later you're like why do I feel like shit yeah and then it's and then you're like oh it's because all this negative toxic energy that doesn't belong to me is like in in me and I need to like I need to let it out Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to do that but yeah so it's that point of I was just like, I need to go to an energy yeah. healer. And I feel like that's, it just makes total sense. Yeah, I hold on to other people's problems mm. because I've always tried to help and be a giver. When at the end of the day, sometimes they didn't even ask for it. You know what I yeah. mean? But I'd be like, what can I do? Yeah. Or, hey, I got an idea. And they're not even asking for it. So I've also been paying attention to that as well. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, they don't want my help. Yeah. Exactly. Either. So it's like, slow your rollings, take care of yourself first. Yeah. Which I'm getting better at. But I do believe I hold on to like other people's problems and energies Mm -hmm. because I'm willing also to listen to them. Yeah. So I'm listening and then it's like invading my body. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think that's also really important because I think being a giver, right? And also realizing that sometimes we give for the validation of having give yes, given yes, right yes and so yes. it's like where is that intention really coming from is it because we need someone else's validation right. or is it because we genuinely are like giving without expectation spot on yeah and I've definitely been in both mm-hmm. both of those yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so okay what are you most excited about now when it comes to like the things you're working on things you're investing in yeah so I'm not trying to work on as far as like starting a new company or a new project. Um, I've come to terms with like not wanting to do that. Mm. Um, I think I got really worn out by the Quarry Project um, and like doing my own thing. So I rather spend like say that money that I would start a new company or whatever it was to angel invest, invest in crypto, 
possibly buy more real estate and use my money in that way and mm -hmm. continue the education with you and others in the crypto space because I am not even close to being able to I have a couple of friends like, oh, you're learning all this. And I was like, do not listen to me about any of this, but I got people for you, yeah. you know? Um, so I'm really excited about those opportunities yeah. that you're going to be able to put me in situations where I can give five to 10 K instead of having this minimum of a hundred to 300 K to be a part of something that I believe in mm -hmm. or a person I believe in. Um, so in that angel investing area is and continue with the crypto and NFT space, continue to learn, um, hopefully educate others as I get more educated. Yeah. I'll never give up on my real estate. I still love it. Um, and that's kind of in the path where I yeah. am at and continue to have the energy that I have and attract uh, not the right or correct people, but the ones that are meant to be around mm -hmm. me and who is for me and continue on this like new aura, new little Napella, big Napella aura. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back on everything that has transpired over the course of your volleyball career, your entrepreneurial career, uh, now your investing career, what would you say is one of the biggest lessons that you've learned that you're going to bring into this new phase? Yeah, at the end of the day, the lesson always has been is like you can't listen to other people that are, you know, talking down on you or don't believe in you. Mm -hmm. If you want to go for something, you go for something. And um, that is like mainly the biggest lesson. And I was, like I said, so fortunate I had the family and the backing to really believe that while I was going through all of that. Yeah. Um, and then the biggest lesson is, I mean, I had to be a leader. I was a captain for two Olympics and the leadership and the level of communication and relationships that I had to have, I can that has given me like the backbone to now in my business life of being able to communicate if needed, be a leader um, and just develop those relationships and be able to communicate with people to hopefully do big things, you yeah. know? And so those are the biggest things. That's why I can never say like, I mean, my volleyball career was epic, you know, and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I accepted it and I really um, pushed forward in it. But when what I could take from that is just huge of in my now after volleyball life. Yeah. Of what I can use from that career. And it just doesn't look like it in the volleyball world now. But it's like so many of the same skills. Mm. And final question for you. Yes. What does being a bad bitch mean to you? Being a bad bitch to me is unapologetically being yourself. That is being a bad bitch. Like knowing your worth, going for what you want, um, not looking back, maybe to reflect, but hey, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, hopefully we can learn from them. We're going to continue to make mistakes, especially if we take risks. And just continuing that is being a bad bitch. Amazing. Well, Lindsay, thank <laughs> you for being the bad bitch that you are and for being a part of the Bad Bitch Empire. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>